Good evening and welcome to the Spirit of Motorsport TV. And this evening, we make our transition from the coverage of the TT through to the British Superbike, which they introduced their first round at Donington this weekend. And who better to join us in the studio this evening than former BSB and World Superbike champion, Mr. Neil Hodgson. So remember guys, this is an interactive studio, so feel free to send us your questions. Also, for future shows and future reference for you, reminder, you can join us in the show. So all you need to do is send us a little message. We'll get you hooked up. You can join us in the virtual studio. Speak to your favorite riders and our guests that will join us in the studio. And we'd love to hear from you. So please do send our questions as we are here for the next hour with Mr. Neil Hodgson. Welcome to the studio, Neil. Hello. How are you? You all right? Great. Yeah, thanks for coming on. I'm, uh, I've never done anything like this before. I'm really nervous. <laughs> <laughs> oh, thanks we'll for having me. No, of course. Thanks for having me. Of course. Where are you in the world? Um, I'm in the kitchen. And <laughs> I was just looking, actually. I'm doing the most middle class thing I've ever done in my life. I'm watering the grass. I mean, I need, I think I need some hobbies. I need to get out more. But watering the grass is not. My girlfriend just, she just. She's washed her hands of me, literally. She's just like, oh my God, you're such a boring old man. So, yeah, that's what I'm doing, living the dream. Great. And how have you coped with COVID and all the changes and not being able to get out and about and traveling, getting to tracks, et cetera? Not too bad, really. Um, obviously, at first, it was a shock for everyone and that was stressful for everybody. But then once I got my head around it, um, I've tried to make the most of it. And by that, just normally I'm traveling all the time, as you know, with my job and I have done pretty much since I was about 18. So I'm 46 now. So it's like I'm getting a year off from travel. So I'm, I'm, I've made the most of just doing very simple things, going for walks, <laughs> back to my rock and roll lifestyle. So <laughs> yeah, just doing, just doing normal stuff and sleeping in my own bed and eating home cooked food and watching telly, you know, all great. that stuff. Sounds great. Simple things, hey? I know. What about you? Um, well, I've been busy, actually. We've been doing this online, which is great. And I have another business which has been keeping me busy. So it's it's been good to be at home, like you say. I travel a yeah. lot as well. So it's been really nice to just regroup and be based in one place for a while. So I've been quite grateful for it. Oh, good. Happy days. And connecting with some incredible people on this platform as well, obviously. Yeah. Well, I saw you did an interview with Big H, Paul I Hunt, know. Travelling <laughs> Marshall, who's yeah. officially my a good friend of mine, but a tall hero. Like, a, mm. if there was world championships for people's personality, he'd be <laughs> ten times world champion. You know what I mean, though. Like, he's a I good know. guy. So, yeah. from our industry, from you know the motorsport industry, especially the, obviously the TT side of things, yeah, he's mm. a diamond. I love it, love it. We've got to get him back on the show. The Travelling mm. Marshals are incredible guys, aren't we? So, um, yeah, they were really popular. We're going to invite them back on for sure. So, coming back to you then, Neil. Now, we've invited you on with your amazing history of the British Superbikes. We've got them kicking off again this weekend at Donington. Thank God for that. <laughs> so, we've got six-round um, showdown coming up. So, what are your thoughts moving into this weekend? How do you think the riders are going to be feeling after such a huge break from the track they will be nervous really mm. nervous because it is the shortest championship like you say um lots of unknowns for the riders obviously there are lots of knowns unknowns for us all because you just don't know what's going to happen i'm so excited for it for the start of the british championship i've always i've always loved the the format of the bsb they do a great job um great race circuits in england Great fans, I know the fans won't be there, but you know what I mean? It just the whole atmosphere of BSP is superb. All the support classes are like, you know. Um, so they'll be so nervous though, because it's it's such a long time and you go through that many emotions before the start of a season. Mm. And they've now had to go through that to prepare for the start of the season that never happened. Then, you know, the period of is it or isn't it? And then you've to re sort of get that feeling back and not peak too early. But it's one of those if I was a team manager, you're like, normally, as a team manager or as a manager of riders, I'd, I'd say, listen, it's a long season. You know, let's not, don't, obviously you go for it, but don't be silly early on. You know, consistency and all that lot. Well, to be honest, with such a short championship, you've just got to go for it. You know, and mm. fortune favours the brave. So you've just got to get stuck in and 
show me who the boss is. So th mm. there'll be some bloody good racing, I can tell you that. I can't wait. Um, no. So I, we had Chrissy Rouse on the show. I don't know whether you managed to catch that with the great Don Herbertson. Uh, they were quite entertaining, those guys together. Now, Chrissy, Chrissy at the time was still injured. So it's given him time to sort mm. himself out. He's managed to get a bit of money together and he's going to be racing. So it's going to be exciting to see what he delivers. Yeah, well, he's, is he running with Phil Crow's team? I think he might be. I don't mm -hmm. know if he is. Yeah, Phil, he is, obviously, he is. I know Phil. Phil Crow is officially the fastest big lad I've ever seen. <laughs> like, at one stage, he weighed, well, he weighed over 20 stone. And I remember following him from down my ear. Yeah, I have never seen a man lean a motorcycle over as far as him. But he's, <laughs> yeah, you can ride him, big Phil. <laughs> well, it's, gonna, it's certainly going to be great to see what Chrissy does and delivers. So what about the lineup then? So there's obviously some great riders there. But one, one I do want to bring to the table is the youngest rider that's going to be um, getting out there. And he's 16. Storm. Yeah. 16, yeah he's 17, he's, he's 17 now, right? Yeah, he's 17 now, but he would have been 16. Yeah. Obviously, if it, the, the, yeah. the, uh, if it had started when it was supposed to. My yeah. God, Storm Stacey. I know him very well, very well. <laughs> I've ridden with Storm on track. I knew his, uh, um, he, I, um, I knew his dad very well, who unfortunately uh, died quite a few years back. But um, know his mum, uh, incredible natural talent, larger than life personality. You can't not like Storm. He's not right. He's not right at all. <laughs> but in, but in such a good way. You know what I mean? Yeah. In such a good way. And it, th there's two types of riders. What I've seen over, over the years I've been involved. There's some that cope better with more power and mm. some that just can't handle the extra power, extra weight. Well, having watched Storm's upbringing and watched his skill at sliding dirt bikes and um, dirt track bikes, he's gonna, the, the, the power of a superbike is really going to work for his style. So it, he, he's like an interesting subplot because he isn't going to win any races in his first year in superbikes. He's just, and I don't mean that negatively, but he's not. Mm -hmm. But to watch his progression is going to be really, really interesting, I think. Exciting. And he's going to be a great character around the paddock, though, isn't he, as well? Yeah. Yeah, like I say, he's not right. He's not right. <laughs> <laughs> I love His him. pictures I love just him. make you smile, though, don't they? They really do. It's, it's entertaining. Yeah, yeah. Great. Um, well, Guy Martin, it's like Guy Martin, isn't it? Guy yeah. Martin's not right, but you just look... I mean, <laughs> who doesn't love Guy Martin? It's not right, but... <laughs> But he's Guy Martin, isn't he? And Storm's are pretty similar. He's not right, but... It's so true. So true. Storm will watch this and he'll be texting me going, what do you mean I'm not right? Because that's the sort of thing you'll do. Oh, watch, brilliant. Watch this space, yeah. yeah. <laughs> um, and who else do you think there is uh, going to be to look out for over the weekend? Well, it's the, the beauty of the first round of the championship I was saying, we were talking about today with a mate of mine. I'm like, I've no idea what's going to happen. I mean, you look at the form book and you go, well, Josh Brooks, surely he's staying in, mm -hmm. in Paul Bird's team, which is so experienced. That Ducati is the best bike on the grid. It is. Mm -hmm. You know, I've, everybody I know that's ridden a Ducati, they go, bloody hell, it's a MotoGP bike. So, you know, it's the, probably mm -hmm. arguably the best team, Birdie's team. The Ducati is the best bike. And Josh Brooks is a previous winner of the championship. So he comes in a hot favourite, really. But then if you mm -hmm. saw the test at Donington the other week, he wasn't great. All I could think is he was working on race setup, not going for one one lap wonder. But yeah, there's so many riders, Kawasaki riders like Danny Buchan's interesting. I'm very good friends with the McKenzie family, so Taryn and Taylor. Taylor's unfortunately got a bad knee, so he's going to struggle this weekend. So I don't expect to see Taylor McKenzie anywhere, anywhere really. But Taz is super fit and ready to get stuck in. So. Uh, Bradley Ray on the BMW, he's moved from Suzuki, worth watching, should be there in the mix. I could sit here and literally go through 15 riders who should be in the mix, and I don't know how it's mm. going to pan out, so mm. yeah, it's going to be entertaining. Great. God, I bloody can't wait to get it started. Um, so, Neil, let's come back to your history then with the British Superbikes. <laughs> there's, uh, there's been a little bit of drama. And obviously some amazing achievements. So um, going back to 2000, we have to, uh, obviously you had all sorts going prior to that, but that's the big one that I want to start with, if that's all right with you. So fill us in on what that year meant to you and, and, and how it felt with the result that you took away from that season. Well, that season was like a, what happened to Scott Redding last year. I'd come back to England and it was a, I'd been to World Championship Racing it hadn't gone according to plan for lots of reasons. And I could, 
could talk for an hour. My excuse book somewhere, it's massive. <laughs> no, you know what I mean, though? There's loads of reasons. In the end, it just it didn't work out. So I came back to rebuild to hopefully find the confidence, hopefully win, and potentially go back into world championship racing. And basically, that's what happened in the 2000 season. But it was an incredible roller coaster ride, uh, roller coaster ride, and made more of an exciting season because of my battle with Chris Walker. We didn't get on. We were two different characters with two different motorcycles that were, had strengths and weaknesses on different parts of the track. And unfortunately, sometimes them lines crossed over. Hence, we collided a lot. People always say to me, you, oh, you and Chris Walker, you know, collided a lot. I always say, yeah, but you only saw the ones that the cameras caught. You didn't see the ones in the practice sessions where obviously there were a lot more going on. So, um, yeah, and for me, it was my, my favourite season of racing, but also the, probably one of, one of, if not the, the hardest season of racing. Yeah. Oh. There we go. <laughs> Fill us in on this uh, picture if you could. I don't know what year that is, actually. I reckon that could be. I don't know if that's. I think that's two, from 2001 when I was doing World Superbikes. And I'd say that's okay. Brands Hatch. And I was so lucky because what was funny, when I, started, when I started racing, I got quite a good following. And then when I was pretty crap at World Championship racing, I didn't really have any fans. And then I came back to England and Chris Walker had all the fans because he was really popular. Yeah. But then when I went back into world championship racing, people got behind me, thankfully. And I met some unbelievable characters. And I met, obviously, I met those, those chaps. I don't know their names, but you can't believe what it, it's a strange feeling when you see that. Because obviously I'm a, a normal person. And when you see people dressed up with your name written all over them, it's just, it's bizarre and it's nice, but you don't, you never know what to say. You're like, Oh yeah. Mm -hmm. Cheers. Like, you know, <laughs> it's funny, really, really funny. Nice wig. <laughs> yeah, yeah, exactly. No, it's... Hair envy. Um, I'm just going to share some of the comments we've had, Neil. So remember guys, this is an interactive show. You can fire your questions our way, your comments, etc. We'll share them with Neil. Uh, Nicholas says, hello. And uh, Dean Sturman says, Mr. Hodgson, top bloke. And Paul Bond says two man, so he's agreeing with Dean. Thanks, guys, for your comments. Um, great. So coming back to 2000 and the dramas that came with it. Woo! <laughs> yeah, lo lo lots of dramas. I mean, it went obviously down to the last round, but what had yeah. happened on the penultimate round, I crashed and threw away the, the title, really. It was like, oh, mm. I crashed in a, in a wet race. And then Chris, I can't remember what lead he had going into the last round. And it was sort of, it was... It was done really because Chris was always consistent and then he broke down in the last race which then handed the title to me but there was obviously a lot happened before then there were collisions there was um stewards inquiries there were penalties there were RAC tribunals there were barristers involved it got really messy really messy and it was full on this is how racing should be in my opinion don't get me wrong. Yeah, it's great when they all get along. No, it's. I want them, I want people not to get along when they're racing. I want people to really dislike each other. So it means even more, you know. And for me, mm. I didn't like Chris at all. <laughs> Chris was so much more intelligent than me. He played the game really well and all that lot. And I was like a, you know, I was like a grumpy kid. But um, <laughs> but we didn't we didn't we, we didn't get on. Just so you, to be clear, we get on really well now and I've got oh. massive respect for him. And because he brought the best out in me, like I brought the best out in him. And both our careers went forward because of our hatred. So, mm. so bring on more hate, that's what I say. There he is. <laughs> the oh, stalker. <laughs> yeah. So that, that was, that's, in, that's at Phillip Island. So I think that mm. is, that's 2001 when we were doing... Um, so then we... Oh, no, sorry, two, 2002, when he was riding for Kawasaki. So, yeah, we're smiling then. We, we still didn't yeah. like each other then, though. We didn't like each other yeah. then. We pretended to, though. You know, you, when you play that game, when you pretend that you get on with someone, but you don't, you know it well. We do it all the time, don't we? But So, yeah, so happy days. How did that impact your mindset, though, of all those dramas going on, on the, in the paddock and going into race weekends? How, how did that was it a distraction or was it just spurring you on to, to do even better? Like you said, leveling up. Do you know what? It, it had pluses and minuses to it. There were points mm. where it got, it did get to me, the pressure or the, the, the stress of racing him because he was intense was Chris. 
very aggressive. Mm. And like I said, because we've got two different motorcycles, mine was faster than his on the straights, but he's turned better. Mm. And um, I remember one weekend at Knock Hill, he followed me in the race all the way around and passed me on the last lap. And it, I was so angry and so annoyed that then in the next race, I rode so tight because I was trying to go even faster. But I, if you ride tight, you know, there's no flow, you're not relaxed. So, so and it, it got to me a little bit then. But there were other times when I rode really well because of the stress of trying to beat Mr. Walker. But it was never good when you came across the, the line, and you saw the pit board, and your pit board would say plus, plus zero, which means the guy behind you is on you, Walker. Mm. It was not a good feeling. It was like incoming, you know what I mean? At any time, you know he's going to dive bomb you. Mm -mm. Creepy stalker coming up behind you. Exactly. <laughs> <laughs> uh, you got a couple of comments here, Neil. So Mike Kenny says, hey, Neil, what did you think of Lee Johnson's time in Donington test? Um, oh, and Chrissy, Ro Chrissy Rouse led the stock, though, testing at 108. Yeah. Um, yeah, Johnson, I didn't, right? yeah, I didn't know. <laughs> I, I missed that one. I missed the super stock. I saw that. I knew, I know Chrissy was fast. But I didn't know that Lee Johnson. What's Lee Johnson riding? I've missed that one. Sorry, I missed uh, that one. I'm not too Sorry. sure. Yeah, Mike. Mike, Sorry, if Mike. you could. Yeah, Mike, if you could. Yeah, don't hate me. Don't hate me. <laughs> no. Yeah. Hey, talk, talk about personalities or Lee Johnson. He stayed at my house. It's yeah. funny. On, on, on the Isle of Man, my son's got a car bed, right? And it's um, actually he's still got it and he doesn't want it anymore because he's 12. But this car bed is really small. And Lee Johnson came and Lee Johnson's only small. And I went, you're in the car bed. And he absolutely loved it. This little car, you know, because Lee Johnson's such a personality, such a character. So yeah, uh, I, lo I love Lee. Great, one of the, great. One of the good guys. Mm. Um, and you have also Patrick Kitchen says, what about a comeback at the Diamond Races next year? Ooh. Bloody hell, no thanks. My God, <laughs> no. No. My, I, I, I'm excited about the Diamond Races. That's going to be really interesting. Yeah. How it all pans out. I was talking yeah. to a friend of, friend of mine today who said he's done a lot of tarmacking on the Isle of mm -hmm. Wight. He said pretty much right. nearly every road we've done. It's a guy wow. called Eugene McManus. You won't have heard of him. Mm. But he used to race against, we used to race together in the mid 90s. He did Grand Prix racing. He was a fast, real, real fast Irishman. So he, um, he's over at Donington this weekend because his son's Eugene McManus. He races in the stock 600s. But we, we, we talked about the diamond racing because he's, he's a tarmacker. That's what he does for a living. So he said, I've tarmacked all the roads there. So hopefully, at least the surface should be good. Mm, can't wait to see how it turns out. I know, out. I'm excited. I'm excited yeah. for that. Uh, and Roy Moore. Good evening, Roy Moore has commented. Nice to, oh, where is he? Nice to have had you as a Manxman for a while, Neil. Remember when, well, the night at the Ville Marina? At the Steve Hislop Memorial Night, I often use that as a claim to mix in with the famous. <laughs> yeah. Oh, bloody hell. I've, I've had some big nights on the Isle of Man, as you can imagine. <laughs> yeah. look, look, love the place. Special place. Yeah. It, is it is a special it place. It is. Mr. It TT is. this year. Oh, I know, right? It was um, painful. Yeah, painful. It really was. Um, good. Okay, great. So I just want to come back to the British Superbikes, if we could, Neil. And I want to talk about the wild card races that you attended. So and that it was 2000 as well, wasn't it? And then you yeah. took um, the win at Brands, Brands Hatch. Yeah, How I won, it, I won it Donington, Donington and Brands because yeah. they had two rounds that year in the mm. UK. So, yeah, that was the, the win at Donington as a wild card in the World Superbikes was uh, the best race of my career. So I raced mm. for tw 20 years, road race for 20 years, but I also did motocross for <laughs> six or seven years. So I had a long career racing. So that was the race. If I could relive one moment again in my life, that'd be that race, that last lap, because I did a, a pass Pierre Francesco Killy. It was my mum's absolute hero. My mum adored Pierre Francesco Killy because he was this really good looking Italian. So I think my mum had mixed feelings when I won because <laughs> she was pleased I'd won, but Pierre friends, I passed him on the last lap and he'd led the whole race. So I think she'd mixed feelings, but uh, she was crying when I was on the podium. So I don't know if that was for joy for me or she was just upset for the guy she fancied. It was good looking though. I can't lie. He still is actually. I said, I saw him, <laughs> saw him last year in Mizano and he's got these piercing blue eyes. He's much, he's about 10 years older than me, but anyway, I've gone off on a tangent, Anna, talking about how good looking <laughs> Killy is. 
I want to get a recent man. picture of him up. Yeah, Hans, age, Hans, Hans, Hans Savannah. <laughs> Dad starts to sweat talking about him. <laughs> Just what's that saying? Deep breath. Take a deep breath. <laughs> I, need to I need to tend to me grass. <laughs> shall I move the Shall I move the sprinkler around? <laughs> so yeah, but what that did, um, Haley, basically, whatever you do in BSB races, the World Superbike Paddock is always watching. But mm -hmm. the fact that I beat the best, and I think a lot of people mm -hmm. from the World Superbike Paddock thought, yeah, Neil's a good rider, but is he, is he world class? Is the question? He's been here before. I didn't quite cut it, so I shut a lot of people up. And that's why I loved it so much because to come back into a paddock that you'd been sort of cast out of because you weren't good enough and come back in and give them the good old fashioned, I'm back, you know, obviously mm. I've no style, so it's <laughs> flash of ease, but you know what I mean? Just that's to everyone who's doubted me. And that's what it felt like riding. Mm. It did, honestly, even in, I knew I was going to go well that weekend, but even in practice, I was waiting back for riders to come past me so I could dive bomb them. Which is a bit dirty, mm. but <laughs> I couldn't help myself. <laughs> <laughs> Love it. Okay, so um, oh, Mike Kenny's come back to us. It's Kawasaki was on. Mm. Uh, so Johnson was on a Kawasaki. All right, missed up, missed it. Sorry. Yeah. Feel bad um, now. And uh, yeah. also, hey. Mark Hammond was hey. saying. Part time <laughs> expert. Here I am, part time <laughs> expert. Who's he? What's he on? It's, rusty. it's COVID. Um, yeah. And then the E, oh, what's he saying? Okay, so we have Mark Collins again. He's asking if you will be going, attending the Diamond Races, go and check it out. And he also said, thanks for the banter at the free coffee stand at the London Bike Show earlier this year. You're a top geezer. I love a free coffee stand. <laughs> yeah, who doesn't? If there's anything free, especially at a bike <laughs> show, you know, when you just need, I always need caffeine to find my personality. I find the old personality on its way down. You're like, Get me a coffee quick, otherwise I'm going to be a right miserable sod. So, yeah, if, if, it, if there's a free coffee stand anywhere, that's huge way you'll see me floating around. But, <laughs> yes, I will attend. The man's got some good coffee. Have you tasted his coffee? Do you know Very what? Good. I've still never been to his place in Ramsey. I've been Ooh. to his – because he used to have the little takeaway van, didn't he? Yeah. When he first started, I don't know if he, I'm sure he's still got that. So I've mm. had a few off Connor. Mm. I think he's charged me as well, the bugger. I think he did How charge rude. me. You know what I mean? <laughs> Bloody hell. But yeah, I will be going to the Diamond Races. Absolutely. I've got a really good friend of mine called Graham Darby, lives on the, on the Isle of Wight. Ah, so okay. if, if it, as long as he doesn't class with a, a motor, motor GP, absolutely yeah. I'll be there. Yeah, it's going to be mega, I think. And how great to, because it, it's uh, some of our organisers, isn't it, that's, that's linked up with it. Um, okay, great. So just one more question. And then, um, so we've got uh, Helen Kenny says, is that Mike and Helen Kenny? You've got two. Got a family. Yeah, I'll tell you what, the family is getting the bloody money's <laughs> worth here. <laughs> Helen, bugger off, Helen. We're speaking to your husband, all right. <laughs> she says, Hi, Neil. We had so many amazing races from Great Britain and World Superbikes, British Superbikes, and road racing. Why do you think we have such a small representation in MotoGP? That's a great question. Quest it is a good question. Oh. It's, it's a question that we've all been asking, <clears throat> you know, all the. Uh, people in the industry it's, it's a question that's commonly talked about i think the biggest issue one of our problems is that we have got such a good domestic championship and people are pushed towards superbikes there's a bit of that plays a part what what's happened unfortunately now when you look at spain and italy that they, they are so set up if you go to spain there'll be a little go-kart track and there'll be 200 kids under 10 riding around on mini motors they've got great championships and just going off the the odds, you know, if you've 200 kids, a couple of them will end up going into Moto3 and then they work their way up into MotoGP. Where I know we've got some good um, uh, kid championships in the UK, but we just don't have, they're not as well attended, I don't think. I think mm. on that side of things, we are improving, but it starts literally when you're seven or eight years old. So I think that that's some, an area that I guess we can improve. But it's difficult, mm -hmm. isn't it? It's an expensive sport. It is, it is. You know, we're, 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 always an issue. Yeah, so, yeah, tough. Great, okay. Um, so I have to touch on then. We had one of the followers, one of the fans, mention your Troy Bayless um, team orders. T team orders. Yeah, that yeah. went down well. That, <laughs> tell you what, that went down well. 
He's still so not that, forgiving you. So uh, yeah, a little bit of no, an explanation would be wonderful. Yeah, I'll, I'll tell you the story. So Troy Bayliss, mm. it's the last round of the championship. Mm. And I can't remember who was battling. Walker was one. Maybe someone like John Reynolds. There was a, a few. And Troy was struggling a bit that weekend. Pre maximum pressure. No pressure on me. I was fourth or fifth in the championship. So it was no massive deal. Um, and what happened was the team had said to me, last round, you can't beat Troy, you know, because he needs a point for the, for the championship. And I'm like, well, well obviously them. My employees for the following year, I got paid well off them. And you have to do what your boss says. If you're in an office and you're working mm -hmm. and you're off, your boss says, listen, you need to work on Saturday, you're not going to go, well, screw you, I'm not. So I had no choice. I did have no choice. But where I'm stupid is I was not happy to do it. So what I thought I'd do is I thought, well, if I'm going to do team orders, I want everyone to know mm -hmm. I'm doing them because it annoyed me. But it weren't my mm -hmm. decision. So what I did, like a fool... Instead of subtly rolling off, I just went as fast as I could, right up to the last lap, and then did this. And then just shut the throttle and let them pass, and people hated me for it. But it goes on in racing. But it's usually the last round. It's not like Formula One. Do you remember Formula One that year? What? Yeah, yeah. In Australia, Australia yeah. I can't remember who it was, but someone it was let Lew somebody pass. Lewis First Hamilton, wasn't it? Uh, wasn't it? Was it Lewis Hamilton? Was it uh, Coulthard? Was it, um... and someone? Honestly, that was literally, that was the day I stopped watching Formula One. Mm. How, how on earth can you have team orders at round one in a championship? Mm. And the story was that they'd had a discussion of who got this whole shot, because it was always going to be between the two teammates. So who was mm. a, into the first corner first would win the race. Mm. What a load of bollocks. Oh, yeah, my yeah. God. Yeah, so so anyway, so yeah, I did team orders. I, I, I finished third in the race. And I got on the podium and everyone booed me. But I'd have booed me. You know mm. what I mean? I would have. If I'd have been in the crowd, I thought, oh, dick. But it wasn't my choice, was it? So No, it wasn't your choice. And it's no, pretty I, frustrating for you as well at the same yeah, time. It really frustrating for me. Going. Yeah. And I'm mm. sure, I'm sure I didn't get the bonus money for the second place or first or whatever, wherever I should have been. I should have got the bonus money. That's something. In fact, let me just make a note of that. I'm just going to make a phone call. <laughs> Just it was 1999, but think of that actually the bonus money with the interest. Bloody hell, yeah, get that. Sorted. I'll just make I've, I've, a reminder. I've got a <laughs> yeah. I've reminder. Um, so just one little comment here from Ian J. Cam. He said, Got to admit that he cried for Stalker that year, 2000, yeah. it was, but it was a brilliant year's racing. Still got a big poster up in his garage, and you and Chris were great racers. Oh, do you oh. know what? The, the majority of people cried for, for Chris, and it. At the time, obviously, I had no sympathy for him. But then as, you know, as you get older and, and you look back, and he did nothing wrong, you know, he did nothing wrong at all. It was his championship, 100%. I think there was about four laps to go when his bike blew up, you know. So, and he, he um, most people know this, but he was so devastated. He walked straight back into the paddock, got changed, but like quickly, and then just walked out of the track and started walking. With nothing, didn't take his mobile phone, didn't take his wallet, just walked because his head had, was had exploded with a disappointment. You can imagine what it must have been like. And he uh, he walked all the way to East Midlands Airport, which is a fair old walk, and just sat. He's talked. We've talked about this afterwards, you know, having a beer. I didn't tell him what I was doing, but I, he said, uh, <laughs> and I was just sat in like this, is like you know, at East Midlands Airport, just looking at the table. So yeah, it was horrendous. A lot of people cried. Oh. Yeah. I think I've just shed a tear yeah. for you right there. Um, all right, so we have another question coming up now, Neil. So it's from a young fan asking, what's the youngest do you think that it's okay for someone to ask their dad for a bike? Well, um, as soon whoa. as you can talk, if you, can, if, if you manage to type that message, it's about time you ask your dad for a bike. And I tell you what, it's about time your dad got his bloody hand in his pocket that's what oh, I reckon. Hey, up. Yeah. Hey, up. <laughs> well, I'll tell you what, that's backfired, hasn't it? <laughs> You're right, Taylor. Hey, hello, hello. You said you didn't want a bike. <laughs> yeah. Oh, listen, right. When you was really young, remember, we used to go out on the electric bike all the time, didn't we? 
Yeah. And then what did you say when we was trying to do it a little bit more? Tell me exactly what you said. Come on. Oh, I can't really remember. You said, look, I don't really want to do it anymore. That's what you said. And it upset me so much. And I've honestly I've been crying ever since. No, <laughs> I'll tell you what you said. You said, mum says it's really <laughs> dangerous. Can you remember that? Yeah. I'll tell you what, Taylor was so good on a, because we had a little Osset Trials bike. Uh, he was riding it before he was three, it, when he was two years old. And we used to take him up at uh, the BMX track behind the grandstand. Mm -hmm. And he was brilliant. He was so good. And then look Thank at him now. He's obsessed <laughs> with football. Oh, what? <laughs> Aren't you? Yes. Um, I've Is... got some questions for you. Oh, oh fire away, yeah. Taylor. Fire away. You, you're pushing me out of my comfort zone here. I can't <laughs> deal with this. Yeah. Right, go on. Uh, do you wish you were still racing? Mm. No, Good I'm so Taylor. happily retired because uh, I've got no stress and I don't have to worry about getting injured again. Okay. And I can spend even less time with you. <laughs> uh, do, do you want to know, hang on, do you want to know who my favourite uh, child is? Yeah, go on. Holly. <laughs> <laughs> so, Taylor, tell me, would you like to get a bite from your dad and what would you like if you did? Uh, I don't know. I don't know. Can't... Well... As mum would say, it's a bit dangerous, isn't it? Oh, Do you know what, so as well, cool. right? So Taylor started boxing, and he was a really good little boxer, right? Unbelievable. And they wanted him to compete. <laughs> and, and we got to the point, didn't we, Taylor? And then Taylor's like, mum thinks it's a bit dangerous. <laughs> there's, a, there's a pattern going on here, isn't there? <laughs> it got a bit too much. You are? It got a bit too much. Yeah, it got a bit too much. <laughs> yeah but it wasn't me was it it wasn't like i wasn't crazy dad was it no 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 i'm not one of them i'm not one of them dads you know there's nothing worse is there when the dad wants it more than the son <laughs> or daughter you see it all the time don't you in a lot of sports yeah yeah well taylor have you got any more questions for your dad uh yeah i've got one more oh, fantastic fire away would you ever let me do the tt Woo! no <laughs> Just Absolutely, <laughs> no way. I could, I could not. My, my nerves could not cope with that, mate. Uh, I'm sorry. Yeah. Taylor, thank you so much. It's wonderful to have you in the studio with us. Thank you. you. You look, you look really cool, Taylor, on, on TV. Look, look at you. Slick. <laughs> right, you're in trouble. I'll speak to you after this. <laughs> What a cutie. Brilliant. We had to do a little surprise of some sort. I like that. <laughs> that was brilliant. Good. Great. So um, back to uh, the questions, Neil. So George Pope has joined in on the chat and he's asked, who will win Super Sport and best privateer? <clears throat> what are your thoughts on that? In... Um, oh, at BSB. At BSB, yeah. Yeah. Um, that is a good question. That is a good question. I'd probably say Rory Skinner looks amazing. Mm -hmm. So Rory Skinner, I helped him when he was 12 when he did the super teams. <laughs> and um, he just stood out as this real raw talent. And then he got some opportunities, good opportunities, and had some good sponsorship and went to did the Red Bull rookies and all that lot and was impressive, but it just didn't quite work out. And I think he lost a bit of confidence but he's come back to England now and he's building his his confidence up. But I think now, I think he's at that point now, he's like, I think he's still only about 17 or 18. He's not even old. That is right place, right time. He rides for the McCams, not McCams, the uh, McAdams, like the Apple Yard McAdams team, mm -hmm. which is a great team. Robin, who runs that team, is a good friend of mine. He helped me when I raced. So uh, my money's going to be on him. And best privateer in what? In super bikes? Or I don't know any. I don't know the privateers in super, super sport, sport. But in super bike, well, I'll say Storm Stacey, if you class him as a privateer, mm -hmm. he's got nothing to lose. He'll be going for it. He's not mm. right. <laughs> that hat, the hat he pulls off, he does pull it off. Oh, well, you love it. Well, it, that Lester, his dad used to wear that. And mm. the, the first time I met Lester, was um, he came? I'm 
met him in a pub and he, no, well, he, it was arranged. I said, oh, he, he wanted to talk to me about his son and he turned up wearing the hat and all that lot. I was like, bloody hell, I don't know what to say, taken aback, you know what I mean? He had this big shirt on, flowery, wild shirt. And he told me that, that Storm's going to be the next MotoGP world champion and all that lot. And I was like, bloody hell, I'll believe it when I see it. But the, the lad's on his way. You know what mm. I mean? Like, he's on his way. So, who knows? It's exciting, isn't it? It's an exciting yeah. story. Um, so, we've got some pictures to share as well, Neil. So, um, thankfully, we were able to source some wonderful shots of you from back in the day. Um, Company magazine. Eligible bachelor. Oh, my and, God. Um... <laughs> That's like, is that like 25 years ago? Uh, I, I don't I know. Wonder... I have to check with our source. Yeah, what? Ninety-seven. So what's that? So that's <laughs> twenty-three years ago. Twenty. That's not me, by the way, on the front. That's not me. <laughs> All right. Well, you know. Great hair, though. Yeah, um, well, you know, I'd, I'd conditioned it. Oh <laughs> look my at god! That one. What wow. an absolute bell end. Sorry for the that language. Pose, oh my that god! Pose is the best pose. No wonder people didn't like me. Look at that. You had a spray what tan an, as well. What an idiot. <laughs> God, I was 23, 23. I should have known better. What was I doing? Can I, can I tell you about this then? I've got, I've got the proper <laughs> Please the do, truth. please do. This is all my manager was Roger Burnett. And he kept saying, for you to make big money, you've got to break out of the motorcycle mold. You've got to get out of the motorcycle news. You've got to get into the papers. You've got to date someone famous. He'd say stuff like that to me. You've, we'll get you in all these sort of lifestyle magazines. All I wanted to do was race my bike. You know, like, it's like most young kids. But I also listened to my manager. So he got me into these, this sort of stuff. But it did more harm than good. <laughs> it, really? Well, With that pose? I don't, I don't know whether I can believe that, to be fair. Yeah, my God. <laughs> right, get that off, for God's sake. Make me feel no, sick. No, it needs to go bigger. Yeah. Um, all right, but so the, coming back. Just so you know as well, my body's better now. What the, <laughs> what, what was I doing? Those high-waisted Simon Cowell trousers. Yeah, were, love were What an up. Um, all right, so coming back to the racing, Neil, we've got Mr. George Pope is uh, added to his last question about uh, privateer, et cetera. He's also said, how much does it cost to put a bike on the grid and the super bikes now? Bloody hell. How much do you think it? I was going to say, be, being totally honest, I yeah, I haven't got a clue. I haven't got a clue to yeah. to run. Yeah, it'd be a lot of money. Um, yeah, I don't know. It'll be mm. whatever figure I say will probably be wrong. So I think to run a real conservative effort would be half a million quid, probably by the t you know a normal BSB season with you know a proper team of mechanics and hospitality mm. and you know full time staff, maybe even more than that. There you go. Wow. Wow. <laughs> yeah, wow. I'm probably miles off. There it is again. That should have said, that should have said, no, you're miles off. Um, and then, so we've got to touch on, you've got a podcast now called Gas It Out, right? And Gas one of the out. questions by Wayne Brown has asked, this is a great question, Wayne. When uh, will you have Walker on the show? Well, it's funny you say that because we've talked about having him on loads Mm -hmm. And what what happened was, we'd got like a, a thread going of who we were always going to get on. But we, we had talked about getting Chris, but we, we're at that point now where we're at a crossroads with it, where my theory is there's too much bike action on at the moment. So we should have a, just a bit of a rest with the podcast. We did it through lockdown. It was a bit of fun. Mm -hmm. And like this weekend's a perfect example. There's three races, up, three, you know, there's MotoGP, BSB, World Superbike. Is there room for a pod another episode from our podcast? So mm -hmm. I don't know, really. But we should have got Chris for this weekend because me and Gav talked about getting a BSB man on. I can't believe we didn't think about that. I spoke to him yesterday about it. So, but we could still maybe do it tomorrow. Anyway, yeah. But there's no reason why not. It's not like I'm not doing Chris because of our rivalry. There's more mm -hmm. reason to do it than not, you know. Absolutely, yeah. And like I said, yeah. we, we, we're very good friends now. He runs a great dealership. He's Kawasaki dealership. Mm. He's amazing, really, and he's he's grown that, and he's got my respect for that because it's always hard for racers to go to that next stage in their life. What do they do, and are they going to be good at it? And mm. Chris has, you know, like got a, like a, a like a real classy dealership, and he does a really good job. 
good. Well, so soon to, that, to answer yeah. that way. Soon. Soon. Yeah, yeah, yeah. Soon. There's Please. no reason why not. I, I, I promise you that. So we've got um, one of our regular fans here. Grant Hollis has got a question for you, but also, uh, so he says, where and when was the best after race party? Oh, I want to know that as well. Bloody hell. God, there were so <laughs> many. Luckily back then, it, it obviously it was always dead serious and all that lot, but <clears throat> probably there's so many though. You know what I mean? Like you're just like, oh, oh so many. Because what we used to all go in each other's motorhomes. So in the late 90s, they'd be like, Scott Russell would instigate the party or Troy Corsa. It was one of them two. And it would be wild and it'd be all riders. It'd be like, there'd be Fogarty, Whittam, Killy. He'd be there with his beautiful eyes. <laughs> <laughs> um, uh, let me just think. Yeah, Corsa, Goldbert. It was a, a disaster. But everyone was just leathered, Aaron slides. But it, honestly, but that happened all the time. Mm. I remember one time in uh, Bruneau that we had a massive party. That was good. But I don't know, they all seem very similar. Do you know what? Really, in my early like days, I loved it. One. Yeah, exactly. I loved it when I first started, when I started World Championship racing. That was so exciting. So I was like 18, traveling the mm. world, wow. and just uh, like in, in the same paddock as Kevin Schwantz and Wayne Rainey. And when. My first year was 1990. This is my best one. This is clearly the best. It was 1993. And at the last round of the championship, Kevin Schwantz was crowned 500cc world champion. It was obviously what he'd always wanted to do, obviously. And they had a massive party there. It was like the official party. <clears throat> and everyone got destroyed. And I was there with my mum and dad. But like Kevin Schwantz was being carried around on people's shoulders. And Kevin Schwantz was my hero. And we're all singing... We are the champions of the world. Just like a real special memory, you know, because it was just one of those amazing nights mm. and uh, celebrating Kevin Swanson's 500 CC World Championship. I mean, it didn't get much mm. better than that. We're all leather. Amazing. We're all <laughs> twisted, as you can imagine. So, uh, and Just going back to that as well, Grant touched on today. He sent us a message. He was there when you had your first win at Three Sisters in 1990. Is that right? In yeah, Wigan? yeah, first win, 1990. It was like... Round about April time, 16 years old, first year on tarmac, didn't have a clue what I was doing at all. I used to sit in the middle of the bike and just lean it over until I crashed. Literally, I just crashed my brains out. But if I didn't crash, I was fast. So I, I, won, I won the Preston and District Club Championship. And that was racing at Three Sisters. Great little track in Wigan. Great for learning how to ride. It's a little twisty track, really technical. I loved mm. it there. I'd love to go back, actually. I've not ridden it, well, I've not ridden it since 1990. It'll have changed a bit, I'm guessing. So where is your favourite track? Where, I love Brands Hatch. Back at, yes. Yeah, yeah Brands, okay. Brands Hatch was always special to me because mm. when the World Superbikes went there, it was always a sellout. <laughs> so there was around 100,000 people there. The weather was always good. It was summertime. And because of the, it's like a natural amphitheatre, the bankings are all up above the track. So you always felt like you were in a stadium. Even when you were in pit lane, you'd look up. At, so you'd come out on Sunday morning, absolutely papping your pants. You were that nervous. Mm. And you'd open the garage door and the crowd would be, whoa, above you. Because if I walked out, people would cheer. It was weird. But, like, mm. but instantly it made you nervous, but had the most excited, nervous feeling. And I always rode well there. And it's a bit dangerous mm. to track, but I quite like that. Because it made it, it made it feel a bit faster. Because the everything was closer to you, so you felt not like the TT, but it felt a bit, a bit like you know, yeah, yeah, a bit more atmosphere, I guess. So I loved it. What a track! Mm, great. And what would be? Uh, you're quite used to living your in your retirement now, and you're enjoying it. Like you said, you're enjoying not getting injured, etc. But is there anything that you really, really miss about racing? Yeah, I miss standing on the podium. Oh, there's two things. Mm -hmm. I mean, standing on the podium, because that, you, winning, cause yeah. the, the endorphin release you get from that, I've tried everything else. Yeah. It's just, it's a different high, you know what I mean? But it's not, you just, whatever it is, don't quite feel the same. Um, I miss that. And I miss that feeling <laughs> of floating on the bike, which rarely happens. Really, I genuinely mean that. You have years where you don't get it, 
But when it's going so good and you're, you're riding well and you're with a good team and you're winning races, certain laps in qualifying, like a Super Pole lap with a soft tyre in, pushing the limit, but the, both wheels sliding, that's, I can't explain what that feels like because mm. it's not scary at all. It's amazing, you know, but you don't get it much. So, and I'll never get that again. I'll never get that feeling of winning and I'll never mm. get that feeling of, of the, that sensation of being in control of a, a motorcycle. Mm. But I'm all wow. right with it. Yeah. Um, you've got your piece now. I'm not, I'm not, I'm not, I'm not. Oh, that's a bit emotional. <laughs> what have you said you weren't going to talk about oh, that? A moment. Um, so uh, Jennifer Payden has just got a good question for you here. Did you ever want to ride at the Northwest 200? Yeah, I quite <laughs> fancy the Northwest. Mm. Of all the, if, 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 as far as road races go, when I was younger, I raced at Scarborough a few times. Mm -hmm. which is narrow, like, like it's not a road circuit, but it's, it's sort of like one in a weird sort of way. And I liked it around Scarborough, great track at Oliver's Mount. Um, and the Northwest always looked exciting. I was always really good on the straights because I'm tall and skinny. So I was really aerodynamic. When you get tucked in on the motorcycle, and I've got really round shoulders, so I, I could get tucked in really well. So if the Northwest is really long straights, so I'd have always gone well there. So, I, yes, I sort of did fancy it. I never did because, never raced there because my career took me down another route and it mm. had been a, too much of a diversion, like a step, massive step sideways to then go and have a go at doing the roads when I was doing world championship racing. So, mm. good question, though. Mm, that's a great question, yeah. Um, we've got a couple more just before we round it up. Uh, we have Owen Bishop says, which track in the USA has best memories for you during your AMA days? So... so Owen Bishop, he's asked this question <laughs> yeah. because Owen's my best mate from America. Mm -hmm. So when I moved to America, I'll take, I'm going to tell you this one really quickly. When I, when I moved to America, I found a house in a place called Laguna Beach, California. Oh, Google I it. Are you Did you? Oh, wow. Right. <laughs> yeah. oh. Laguna Hills, I love you. Laguna Hills. Well, it's not yeah. quite Laguna Beach. You know. Well, no. No, no, I'm joking. No, yeah. but, um, <laughs> Laguna Beach is stunning, isn't it? Mm, yeah, you know? amazing place. Yeah. And uh, I've been living there not long, and I went for a Thai takeaway. And as I went into this Thai takeaway, this guy went, Oh, it's Neil. And I went, Oh, you're right. English accent. And it was Owen Bishop. Owen's a few years older than me. And he went, Oh, I'd heard you lived in Laguna. I've followed your career, sort of thing. And we, we started chatting. I went, Where do you live? And he went, Oh, I live on Thalia Street. I went, So do I. And we pretty much lived across the road from each other. And we became, we've been friends for life. We became Brilliant. friends then. And um, I know I, I'm going off on a tangent, but uh, Owen had a year off work. It was like changing <laughs> jobs. So when I was racing in America, I raced out there for five seasons. This year off work coincided with him just coming to all the races with me. So we had such a laugh. Mm -hmm. Two English lads traveling around America. Like it was like road trip time. We've, We've got, some we've got plenty of stories, as you can imagine. It's a whole other um, show. So, Owen, my favourite track is definitely not Fontana. That was an absolute crap track. Oh, we went to some, me and Owen, have you? Yeah, yeah. Oh, uh, NASCAR. Yeah, NASCAR. did you? Uh, or Mid-Ohio. There were some real oh. crap ones. Did you go to Mid-Ohio? No, no, I no. didn't. No. You obviously went to Daytona. No. No, right. yeah. oh, oh. yeah. you missed that could you end up you did Fontana you didn't do Daytona I know it was just random it was random yeah. so I, I love Laguna Owen Laguna, Laguna Seca. Seca. yeah wow I'd love to get there I'd That's love amazing, to get there amazing track oh, Owen's such a, well, a a wonderful friend you know when you mm. meet someone and you know actually within probably hanging, hanging around with someone for like a couple of months you think we'll be friends for life mm. and, he, um, and we are so fantastic thanks for joining us owen love that and roy moore just our final comment uh roy have you have any of the current tt starts taken you for a quick lap of the mountain course on a bike or a car and what were you thinking i've i'm good mates <laughs> with john mcginnis <laughs> we grew up we didn't grow up together but we did schoolboy motocross at the same time so our careers we started road racing same year 1990 around that time so i know john really well i have been flat out over the mountain with John, leathered, John not driving, let's get that clear before, uh, <laughs> John, we were in the back of um, like a minibus, it, we were there on his stag do, and basically what we did, we set off at around about one o'clock 
in the afternoon, on a Saturday afternoon, and we stopped at every pub around the Isle of Man and had a pint. I soon realised by Union Mills, I might be struggling here, having a pint. So I soon I swapped that to vodka and coke. But we got absolutely obliterated. But John's dad drove the minibus. He wasn't drinking. Flat out over the mountain with John sort of co-piloting, but not looking where we were going. He could tell by the bumps and we were all weird stuff like that. Like, it was bizarre. It was almost voodoo. We were in this van. Honestly, he was sat at the back of the van leathered and he's going, oh, there's a bump coming up in a minute. Yep, that's it. And <laughs> just he just knew it that well, so. It's another level, isn't it? They are know, another level. And so come into that then, Jay, Jay Margaret. This is a final question for you. Have you ever fancied doing the DT? Not really, oh. because... Again, my career just took a different path straight away. And it, it mm. literally, because it, it, it went like that straight away. And I don't mean I was above it. I mean, I'm just going down a different road. Like, that's probably a better way of explaining it. Mm. So it had been such a detour of my career. And I know, don't get me wrong, short circuit riders did it. But not from my era, actually. They, they really sort of didn't. Not from sort of late 90s on, you know. And that was like the golden part of my career. I've been lucky enough to do parade laps around there. So I've had a chance of riding the circuit. Because mm -hmm. obviously being a Manx resident, you know, I know exactly where I'm going, which helps as well. But it's just a different sport. It's a different sport to what I did. And I just sort of didn't fancy it, even though the Northwest 200 looked almost easy. Well, it did look easier. I think the TT is just, it's such a, it's such a big thing to take on. Mm. So, yeah, mm. I didn't really fancy it. I don't want my son to do it. Taylor's not doing it. <laughs> Oh, bless him. Um, great. Okay, so moving into the weekend then, Neil, if you don't mind. I know it's a tricky one to predict, but we touched on it a little bit earlier, but predictions for the weekend moving into the BSB, um, maybe the one, two, three, if you, what do you think? Yeah, make it, make it really easy for me. Yeah, just, just, <laughs> Who do you think me, might, uh, might dominate if, well, even, me, if we go there? No one's going to dominate. No one's going to dominate, exactly, which is, yeah. that, that's good news. Ta Taz... Yeah. Uh, Tara McKenzie will be on the podium definitely that's all that's my only prediction okay. so great I don't Brilliant. know I don't know but I don't know I genuinely don't know I just know Taz will be on the podium I've been doing some training with him he's so ready he's like you know when they say he's like a coiled spring but he is he's so ready to show everybody great love that brilliant and then what's next for you working this weekend mm -hmm. um Obviously, I've got to turn the sprinklers off. That's the first thing. Um, no. <laughs> um, I'm, yeah, it's uh, MotoGP this weekend, Bruno. So we're doing mm -hmm. that from Hinkley. So that's right. going to be live all weekend. So I'm there. T I'm at Hinkley at 7 in the morning because I'm commentating on the first practice session, which is 8 o'clock, so an hour ahead. So I'm commentating on the Moto3 session. So early to bed tonight. Excited for the weekend. Lots of, obviously, talking points in MotoGP, what's going to happen. You know, can Quattararo carry on winning? Or Ducati's going to bounce back? What's Dovi going to do? Obviously, Marquez is out. So this world title is wide open. Someone new is going to win the world championship. So it's pretty exciting, really. It's going to be interesting to see what uh, what the crack is. Mm, great. Good. Exciting weekend ahead. Um, just before we leave you then, we've got this. <laughs> we had to drop it in, Neil. <laughs> Ah, uh, so mm, what year? I think this goes back to the same magazine, doesn't it? I believe. Yeah. I have no <laughs> idea what, what I don't even know what any of it is. It's just utter, it's all bullshit. <laughs> it's, it's bizarre, isn't it? Oh, great. Love our sauce. Oh my god. So brilliant. Um, thank you so much for your time, Neil. It's been fantastic to help you gear up for this, help us gear up for this weekend anyway. Best of luck with your job this weekend. And um, hopefully we can invite you on once again and we can get talking bikes and uh, you can join our great community again. I'm sure they'd love to see you once more. Absolute pleasure. Enjoyed chatting. Yeah. Thanks, thank Neil. Thank you. Take thank care. you very much. And you take care. Thanks everyone for joining us and thank you for all your questions. Remember, this is an interactive experience. In our future shows, if you want to join us, you want to jump on and uh, ask any questions, feel free to get in touch and we can set you up to do just that. Have a great evening and thanks for riding with us.